I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to be sharing uh, the stage um, this afternoon with, with two of my uh, predecessors, um, George Yap, um, your skilled leadership steered uh, the Alliance through many difficult and uh, decisive moments. The crisis in Ukraine is another difficult and decisive moment. It's also a very dangerous moment and a wake-up call for all of us, not just in Europe, but across the whole of the Euro-Atlantic area. Earlier this week in Washington, I spoke about why the crisis makes clear that NATO matters more for America than ever before. Today, I want to explain why the crisis also shows that the transatlantic bond and NATO matter more for Europe than ever before. Russia's military aggression in Ukraine is the most serious crisis in Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Our vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace has been put into question. Because this is not an isolated incident. It follows a pattern of behavior, of military pressure and frozen conflicts in our neighborhood. Transnistria, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and now Crimea. What connects those crises is one big country unilaterally deciding to rewrite international rules overnight and on its own and recreate new dividing lines in Europe 25 years after the free peoples of Europe erased them. We had hoped this kind of revisionist behavior was confined to the 19th century, but we see it is back in the 21st century. It is based on confrontation, not cooperation, and it poses a real threat to the global order based on our values and the rules that we all agreed to respect. So we need to respond both now and in the future. For now, I see three priorities. First, to reaffirm our commitment to collective defense. Second, to strengthen our support to Ukraine and the wider region. And third, to make clear that we can no longer do business as usual with Russia. First, collective defense. No one should doubt NATO's resolve if the security of any of its members were to be threatened. Our commitment to the security of all allies is unbreakable now and in the future. This commitment is not just about words, but real assets and real actions. More planes to police the airspace over the Baltics. Surveillance, surveillance flights over Poland and Romania. And we remain vigilant and ready to take all necessary steps. Our goal is to defuse the crisis on our borders and make no mistake, we will defend our allies. Second, we will strengthen our support for Ukraine. We will intensify political and military cooperation. And that includes support of the transformation of Ukrainian armed forces into modern 
and effective organizations able to provide credible deterrence and defense against military threats. Enhancing the ability of the Ukrainian armed forces to work and operate together with armed forces of NATO allies. Increased participation in NATO exercises. This will be done both as an alliance and by allies individually. We are also working with other partners in the region to provide the support they need in this time of crisis. And finally, speaking about immediate response, our relations with Russia. In 2010, we agreed to develop a true strategic partnership between NATO and Russia. I still believe that engagement remains the right way forward. But I also have to say that today we see Russia speaking and behaving more as an adversary than as a partner. That is not of our choice. It is of great concern and it puts into question the very foundation of our cooperation with Russia. We have already agreed that no staff level meetings with Russia will take place for now. And we are reviewing the entire range of our cooperation so that NATO foreign ministers can take the appropriate decisions when they meet in Brussels in 10 days from now. However, we are also keeping the door open for political dialogue. Now, this is what we are doing for now. But we must also look to the future because this crisis is a game changer and it undermines the rules-based global order. To uphold that order, Europe and North America must stand together and continue to strengthen our economic and military ties. This is how we can best face up to those who break the rules and how we can continue to protect our values and our way of life. First, we must reinforce our economic ties the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is key and it is urgent. Second, we must make energy diversification a strategic transatlantic priority and reduce Europe's dependency on Russian energy. And third, we must increase defense investment in Europe and strengthen our security cooperation within NATO. The United States has shown a clear commitment to Europe's security. From jet fighters to the Baltics, exercises in the Black Sea, to deployment of the USS Donald Cook to Spain as a centerpiece of NATO's missile defense system. Europeans must play their full part. We have seen encouraging signs, but there is more to be done. We need greater political will, stronger capabilities, and more investment in defense. We cannot continue to disarm while the rest of the world is rearming and some are rattling their arms on our borders. 
NATO's greatest responsibility is to protect and defend our populations and our territories. To do that, we must ensure that we have the full range of capabilities to deter and defend against any threat. To back up diplomatic soft power with military hard power. <laughs> now, <laughs> now we read, we need real power. <laughs> there are many ways to try and challenge NATO. <laughs> but I can assure you, I can assure you that NATO will remain <laughs> strong and vigilant. <laughs> and we will work with the European Union and the rest of the international community to safeguard security and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. Ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare for our next summit in Wales, we will be taking tough decisions on the security of allies, cooperation with partners, and our relations with Russia. Make no mistake, in a changed world, NATO stands ready. Thank you.